The channeled scablands of eastern Washington have a unique geologic history. In fact, the debate surrounding the history of the scablands led to controversy within geologic circles beginning in 1923 when J. Harlan Bretz presented his first paper suggesting a catastrophic flood. The controversy continued well into the 1960s and 70s when the advent of aerial photography illustrated overwhelming evidence for Bretz's theories. The inland northwest and Columbia Basin have experienced two tremendous floods of very different types that led to the unique geology we see today. During the Miocene, massive amounts of flood basalt erupted from fissures in northeastern Oregon and southeastern Washington, pooling on the Columbia Plateau. The lava was very fluid, flowing long distances and filling in the topographically low areas. The flows moved across the landscape, covering over 80,000 square miles, creating a flat lava plain of basalt that is over 90,000 cubic miles in volume. There were over 300 individual flows. Each flow is typically about 10 meters thick, and the entire series is referred to as the Columbia River Basalt Group. These lava flows are some of the largest known to have occurred on Earth. The columnar jointing feature, the five to six sided columns formed as the basalt cools, is familiar to many in eastern Washington. The flows and their erodibility were an integral part of the formation of the channeled scablands. After the lava cooled, tectonic forces tilted the lava field to the southeast, creating the Yakima Fold Belt. The compressional forces created folds, anticlines and synclines, as well as faults in the basalt. These include the Horsehaven Hills, Saddle Mountains, and Frenchman Hills. The saucer-like shape of the Columbia Basin is the result of the weight of these basalt flows that are over two miles deep in the area. The additional weight compressed the Earth's crust with the lowest point near Pasco a mere 400 feet above sea level. During the early Pleistocene, the area was coated with a thick layer of luss, wind-blown silt that is as much as 300 feet deep near Pullman. This luss forms the fertile soil of the Palouse country. Then, during the last ice age, the Cordilleran ice sheet dominated the map of northern Washington. The Purcell lobe of the ice sheet moved into the Purcell Trench and blocked the north fork of the Clark Fork River in northern Idaho. The water backed up into the Missoula Valley, creating Glacial Lake Missoula. Arms of the lake extended south into the Bitterroot Valley and north almost to Flathead Lake. This extensive lake was nearly 100 miles long, 3,000 square miles in area, and contained 500 cubic miles of water, approximately the volume of Lake Erie. Its depth was greater than 2,000 feet, greater than any lake in the U.S. today. Evidence for Glacial Lake Missoula can be found approximately 20 miles west of Missoula along I-90 near the Nine Mile Road exit. A road cut exposes a series of sediments. One couplet, or set of light and dark sediments, marks one year the lake was in existence. One can also see strand lines on the sides of Mount Jumbo and Mount Sentinel outside of Missoula. The 35 or so strand lines show the differing water levels, indicating the various shorelines of Glacial Lake Missoula. As the lake level continued to rise, it disrupted the ice dam. Most likely the water did not overtop the dam, but instead floated it. When the water rose to about 90% the height of the ice, which was between 1,000 and 2,000 feet thick, the dam would float, causing cataclysmic failure. The erosive power of the water is unparalleled in the geologic record as it catastrophically exited Glacial Lake Missoula at speeds between 600 and 750 million cubic feet per second, more than 10 times the combined flow of all the rivers of the world. The raging floodwater carried icebergs, boulders, and other debris as it thundered across eastern Washington, shaking the ground and creating a din that was audible a full 30 minutes before the water arrived. Once the ice dam was breached, the water flowed across the Rathrum Prairie into the Spokane Valley and then split into as many as three tracks, drastically changing the topography forever. Luss was scraped off and basalt was exposed. Plunge pools were created as waterfalls eroded headwardly. Flood sediments were deposited, creating pendant bars and giant current ripples so large they could only be recognized from the air. This flood happened repeatedly, perhaps as many as 100 times during the last ice age. 
As the icy flood rushed across northern Idaho, sediment was dumped in tributary valleys, damming their mouths and creating Lake Coeur d'Alene as well as other smaller lakes. When the water reached Spokane, it divided, crossing the Columbia Plateau. About one-third of the water jumped the drainage divide following the Palouse River, where it rushed up the Snake River into Hell's Canyon and then down the Snake and finally into the Pasco Basin. The rest of the water rushed west into glacial Lake Columbia, caused by the Okanagan lobe of the Coeur d'Alene ice sheet damming the Columbia River at the present site of Grand Coulee Dam. Since the lake was already full, the water diverged. Some of the floodwaters poured down Grand Coulee, over Dry Falls, and into the Quincy Basin. The last one-third of the water flowed southwest between the other two channels, from Wilbur to Odessa, and also into the Quincy Basin. The water from all three trucks converged on the low-lying Pasco Basin. As the flood swept across the featureless Luss Plain southwest of Spokane, 250 feet of easily erodible Luss was almost instantly stripped away, exposing the basalt bedrock below. The eddies and whirlpools eroded large chunks of basalt from the sides and along the bottom of their paths, leaving behind ever-deepening grooves and scouring large bowl-shaped holes called potholes, and creating a maze of interfingering coolies. Some of the coolies are 2,000 feet wide and 75 feet deep. This is considered to be the granddaddy of all scablands with its complex pattern of braided channels extending over 90 miles with paths sometimes 25 miles across. The rushing waters dropped 1,300 feet before reaching the Palouse River. Exploiting fracture zones inherent in the basalt bedrock, the floods carved many small scabland lakes. Deep lakes such as Rock Lake, which is over 325 feet deep and 12 miles long, are not unusual. South of Cheney, the floods continued through Sprague Lake, overfilling Washtekna Coulee and spilling into the Palouse Snake River Divide, permanently altering the path of the Palouse River. This 11-mile-long canyon extends to the Snake River. The maze of coulees and flood features attest to the power of the raging water, as the Palouse River is but a small creek occupying a very large canyon. In the Palouse River Canyon, the floods exploited weak areas in the basalt bedrock, resulting from regional tectonic forces, and the river now follows a zigzag pattern for much of its path to the snake. Palouse Falls itself drops almost 200 feet over a recessional cataract or waterfall head that has been eroded back a full five miles from where the Palouse River merges with the snake. Along the Snake River near Winda State Park is a good area to view giant current ripples that blanket a longitudinal crescent bar of flood deposits that run parallel to the road. The floodwaters followed the Snake River before entering the Pasco Basin. The two more westerly tracts of water encountered Glacial Lake Columbia, north of Spokane, which lay over Spokane in northern Idaho as the Okanagan lobe of the ice sheet dammed the Columbia River. The lake level was at an elevation of approximately 2,400 feet. It was this lake that determined much of the Telford Crab Creek and Grand Coulee Tract pathways. As the floodwaters exited the Spokane Valley, and entered the Telford Crab Creek Scabland Tract, they continued to erode the Palouse Luss. The floodwaters passed through Wilbur and Odessa, depositing large flood bars, a result of the slowing waters as they exited the confines of the Scabland Tracts and entered the Quincy Basin. The Frenchman Hills defined this path as they created a barrier along the southern end of the Quincy Basin. The waters flowed into the Drumheller Channels, an eight mile wide, 400 foot deep gash across the east end of the Frenchman Hills. The channels contain a series of lakes and ponds in the bedrock basins the floods eroded into the basalt. A maze of cataracts and interlinking channels also characterize the area. The columnar jointed basalts exposed here would have been easily erodible. Bretts noted over 150 distinct channelways and over 180 rock basins in the Drumheller channels.
From there, the water paralleled the Saddle Mountains, joining the Columbia River drainage just north of Sentinel Gap. Once through this constriction, the waters expanded, following the Columbia River and depositing boulders up to eight feet in diameter. Strand lines on the south side of the Saddle Mountains near Sentinel Gap indicate the southern reach of Glacial Lake Lewis. The floodwaters of the Telford Crab Creek tract also converged on the low-lying Pasco Basin. The Grand Coulee Tract is the farthest west and is the most famous of the coulees created by the Missoula floods. As the waters moved around the toe of the Okanagan lobe of the Cordilleran ice sheet, they eroded the basalt, exposing granite beneath. This granite provided the stability upon which Grand Coulee Dam was built. Upper Grand Coulee begins near the dam and continues approximately 25 miles to Dry Falls. The basalt walls rise as high as 900 feet and the coulee ranges from one to six miles across. Dry Falls is a series of now dry waterfalls forming a row of scalloped cliffs more than three miles wide, five times wider than Niagara Falls. The rumble of water would have made the ground tremble with its force. The floodwaters flowed into Lower Grand Coulee, then the Quincy Basin before entering the Othello channels and converging on the Pasco Basin. In fact, with all three flood tracks united, the water was converging on the basin at a rate of 15 to 18 cubic miles of water per hour, with the only exit at Wallula Gap, a channel only one mile wide, Glacial Lake Lewis was formed. It had a depth of about 900 feet and a volume of approximately 300 cubic miles. That makes Wallula Gap the largest known dam in Earth's history. Although the water exiting Wallula Gap was 950 feet deep, the discharge rate could only reach 350 million cubic feet per second, or about 8 cubic miles per hour. This rate was only half the rate the water was entering the basin. Water velocity was likely 75 miles an hour through the small water gap in the basalt. The erosion was severe. The twin sisters are particularly prominent basalt buttes in the area, created as the water channels weaved an intricate pattern through the basalt flows. The Levy Park Boral Pit in the Pasco Basin exposes a 20-foot sequence of flood gravels overlain by slackwater flood rhythmites. After exiting the Pasco Basin, the floodwaters moved into the Umatilla Basin where yet another temporary lake was formed. Glacial Lake Condon was about 1,100 feet deep and caused floodwaters to rush up tributary valleys. Once the waters passed through the Columbia River Gorge, they encountered one more constriction as the Columbia River Channel narrowed and curved steeply, creating Glacial Lake Allison in the Willamette Valley. The lake extended as far south as Eugene and farther north than Castle Rock. The waters exited into the ocean along the Columbia River near Astoria and onto the continental shelf of the Pacific Ocean. Flood sediments are found 500 miles from the present day mouth of the Columbia River. This is truly impressive as sea level was much lower during the Ice Age given that so much water was tied up in the continental ice sheets. <laughs>